lost in sin, then Jesus took me. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love and rubbed me baby above. And just a little talk to Jesus make me grow. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our pain is cry, and he will answer by and by. So, preacher types like me, um, when we hear call stories, it really gets our attention. I've learned over the years that the call extends far beyond people who have a vocation in ministry. But if you're a preacher at some time or another, hey, Colleen, you have struggled with this experience that you have identified as some kind of call from God. About three decades ago, I was a member of Tabernacle United Methodist Church, and I went to, uh, I'd been wrestling for a couple of years, been doing some lay speaking, and really had this restlessness in my soul, didn't know what it meant, just knew I felt like I needed to do something with it, and I I remember going to the carport uh, door that led into the kitchen of the parsonage at Tabernacle United Methodist Church, knocked on the door, my pastor, Bill Farmer, invited me in, we sat down at the kitchen table, and I said to Bill, you know, I, something's going on with me, I don't know exactly what's going on, but I'm wondering if I'm experiencing some kind of call, so what do I do? 
So he set up a meeting with me and our district superintendent, Julian Aldridge, who was the pastor here at one time. And Julian gave me a book to read. That was the very first part of the process. The Christian as Minister was the name of the book. And in the book, it spent time talking about a variety of call stories in the Bible. And I was tasked with looking at those call stories and trying to see which ones most resonated with me. There were a lot of call stories named in there. There was the the call story of Abraham in the 12th chapter of Genesis. God says to Abraham, leave your home, leave your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you later. And then there was the call of Moses in the third chapter of Exodus. God, out of the burning bush, says to Moses, go into Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. There was the call of the prophet Isaiah in the sixth chapter of Isaiah. Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And I said, here am I, send me. And of course, there were the call stories of the disciples. Matthew and Mark tell the stories identically. Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee. He sees Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea. He says, follow me, and immediately they follow him. Then he sees James and John, sons of Zebedee. They're in the boat with Zebedee, mending the nets. Follow me, he says. And they immediately get out of the boat and follow him. Now Luke tells the story a little bit differently. Jesus gets into Simon Peter's boat, sits down, teaches the crowd. And after the lesson is over, he tells Peter to cast out into the deep sea. And Peter has been toiling all night, nothing But he is obedient to Jesus, gets this huge catch of fish, uh, says, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And then uh, when he gets back on shore, Peter and James and John, sons of Zebedee, leave everything behind and follow Jesus. You know, I've always been a bit troubled with the immediate response of the disciples. Jesus says, follow, and they just leave everything and follow. And I've always been a bit envious of that. Because that doesn't really resonate with my my response. I was much more plodding and much more, uh, I don't know, slow, less immediate. Now forget my call into the pastoral ministry, just my coming to faith. I was raised in an evangelical church, and so I went to a revival one night. I was about 10 years old, and I I felt my heart stirring in some way, and so I I went to the altar, and I prayed the prayer that the revival preacher told me to pray. I invited Jesus into my heart, and I lived in the euphoria of that for, I don't know, two or three days, but I generally was unscathed by that experience and went on with my life seemingly unchanged, eventually became a teenager and got involved in other things that, uh, that were more interesting to me and fell away from the church, wasn't really interested in religion or the church, and, uh, and then over time started going back to church because that's where my basketball team friends were, and then started dating a really cute girl uh, who was a member of a United Methodist Church, and eventually we'd get married, and now that's, of course, Kathy I'm talking about. And so, but but when, I, when I got back involved, it is Kathy I'm talking about. Be sure we understand. <laughs> hey, babe, if you're watching at home on Facebook. Yes, it was Kathy. So, but I, so I just gradually got back into, into church, not because I'd had some kind of uh, religious experience, uh, and still came back with uh, more questions than I had answers, uh, a good bucket full of doubts, and... But I did find something in my early 20s, actually. I did, I did find that for whatever reason, I just wanted to read the Bible more. Nobody told me you need to read the Bible more. I just, for whatever reason, wanted to. And I found that, that I found some degree of comfort in reading the Bible. Even when I didn't really understand the context of anything I was reading, it just somehow felt helpful in my spirit. And I don't know, I felt just a little closer to God somehow. And, and, and sometimes when I would feel a little closer to God, I feel like I would want to read the scripture a little more. I don't know. There was just this very gradual experience of, of coming back to faith for me. And so, so I am intimidated by the disciples who just drop everything and follow Jesus. That just 
wasn't my experience of responding to Christ's call in my life. Well, the story that we're looking at uh, this morning, the story in Luke, Luke's telling of the calling of the first disciples, I think can be instructive to us, and at least to me, and I hope uh, to us as well. It, it helps me, thinking about this, helps me think about my own call, not only to pastoral ministry, but my call to faith. Helps me think a little bit about your call. It helps me think a little bit about our call <laughs> together. So you know the story. Jesus gets in the boat. There are a couple of boats. Jesus sits in Simon Peter's boat, and he begins to teach. Now, wouldn't you love to have the notes from that Sunday school lesson? We don't know what Jesus said. Have no clue. We just know what he did. And so he says to Simon Peter, go out, push the boat out a little further into the deep water and let down the nets. Well, I'm sure Jesus didn't know that Peter had been toiling all night long and had gotten nothing, absolutely nothing, all night long dropping the nets into water with disinterested fish. I'm sure Jesus didn't have a clue about that, right? Peter's thinking, Jesus, what are you asking me to do? Who is this person asking me to do this crazy thing? But I guess maybe something in something that Jesus said in that Sunday school lesson for which we do not have notes made Peter think that Jesus was worth listening to. And so they put out into the deep. You heard the story that Kevin read for us a few minutes ago. They let down their nets. And this huge, this huge abundant catch of fish. You could almost see it. You could almost hear the, the nets popping and fish jumping out of the net, not being able to be contained and flopping around on the floor of the boat and the, and the, and the other boat coming in and they're adding fish to the other boat and both boats are taking on water. They're beginning to sink. Can you get a sense of the difference in this scene? To the scene overnight. <sighs> Catch anything? No, nothing there. Pull up the nets? No. A boot, an old can, no fish. Back down. I don't think we want to miss what Luke tells us here. This overnight, barren, empty, trying to catch at least one fish to no avail. This overnight, barren experience, empty. And this experience in the day with Jesus in the boat with fish overflowing. I don't think we want to miss the difference here. I think Luke wants us to make a connection. The difference, we could talk symbolically about this, I suspect, right? Here's what life looks like before Jesus. Here's what life looks like after Jesus. Here's what it looks like to go on our own strength. Here's what it looks like to be empowered by the living Christ. So we could look at this, I think, and see perhaps a little bit of our own lives. I, I certainly can as I think about not only my, my call in the past, but my own going call. I mean, call is a continual thing, right? The call to follow Jesus is not a once-in-a-lifetime call. It's an ongoing call. And I know my own tendencies, and perhaps you have the same tendencies. I know my own tendency to try to go out on my own strength. Trusting too much in my strength, too little in God's strength. I know what it's like to have empty nets toiling all night. Do you know what it's like to work and work and work with nothing to show for it? Do you know what it's like to feel barren in your faith? Do you know what it's like to claim faith in Christ but to live as a practical atheist? To say that you believe in God, but live your life as if God did not exist. Well, I suspect I'm not the only one in the room who knows what that feels like. And here's the thing, when you're, when you're toiling at night with your nets empty, it's hard to recognize the folly of what you're doing. In the midst of all the good work, in the midst of the emptiness and the barrenness, it's easy to miss the folly of what you're doing. It's easy not to see the error of your ways. Well, as the story continues, of course, the, the boat is filled with fish. And what is Peter's response? 
Oh, great, we've got a bunch of fish. We're going to have a big fish fry. We're going to make a lot of money now. What was Peter's response? Did you hear what Kevin said? He fell down at the knees of Jesus. Leave me. Depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Interesting response. It reminds me of of Isaiah's response in his call story in the sixth chapter. When Isaiah found himself in the presence of God, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. There's something about standing in the presence of Almighty God that makes you see yourself clearly. Find yourself in the divine presence and the stench of your own sin is in your nostrils in an unmistakable way. You begin to recognize the sinful nature that you've continued to allow to run rampant in your life. And those things that didn't bother you so much before stand in the presence of Jesus and they really begin to bother you. Stand in the presence of the holy and you begin to see how far you are from holiness. It's an uncomfortable place to stand. Maybe that's why it's a real temptation for even good church folks to keep Jesus at some distance. Out there, Jesus is not so much of a problem Out there, I can be comfortable with my sins. You know, it's it's not hard to hide your sins from your family and friends. We're really pretty adept at it. We've gotten good at it over the years. But you can't hide your sins from God. Stand in the presence of God and you see yourself fully. Peter said, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. I hear in Peter's words a real sense of his unworthiness. I don't deserve to stand in the presence of one holy like you because I am a sinful man. Maybe you've heard the story of uh, the children who had gathered. It was homecoming. Parents, adults were getting the food ready, service ready was over, and so they decided they would gather in the church chapel and, and play. They decided they would play church. How do we play church? They thought, well, we could, who could be the preacher? Who could take up the offering? They thought about that, and, 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 but somebody else said, no, no, let's, let's, let's do the story of Jesus. And so they thought about the passion story, and so they decided who would be the centurion and who would be the soldiers uh, guarding Jesus and who would be the women who would be weeping for Jesus. And they looked at little Johnny and they said, little Johnny, why don't you play Jesus? Okay, so what do I have to do? And they said, well, just put your hands up like you're on the cross and we'll call you names and we'll spit on you. And little Johnny said, let's forget about Jesus and let's just play church. You know, without Jesus, it is always night, and the nets are always empty. Without Jesus, no matter what we do, we are always just playing church. But the story doesn't end there. Peter is not left wallowing in his own sin. Jesus says, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. And when they get the boats back to the shore, they leave everything behind and follow Jesus, Simon Peter and James and John, sons of Zebedee. It's a, it's a great story of a long ago moment recorded by Luke. But that's, that's where the Bible gets tricky. 
That's where the Bible is different from any other book on the shelf. Because the Bible is more than just a book of old stories of people long since dead. The Bible is a living word about a living God. And so Jesus called to the disciples then in the first century by the Sea of Galilee or Genesaret is the call to us today in Highlands, North Carolina, 2018, or wherever else our friends may be watching us via Facebook this morning or whatever communities you may represent today. The call then is the call now. The call to leave everything and to follow Jesus then is the call now, the call to be fishers of people, catching people, then is the call now. And so you and I now need to take a close look inside our own hearts. That's the invitation of the scripture. You and I now need to ask ourselves those questions about Am I toiling in the night in my own strength, trusting in my strength rather than God's strength? Am I in this moment in my life holding on to nets that I refuse to let go so that I'm not able to follow Jesus? You and I must ask those questions as we continue throughout our lives. What is Jesus calling us to do, if not simply but to follow? I don't always understand the fullness of what it means to be a faithful Christian. Sometimes I think I've got it. Sometimes we wrestle with issues and questions, and, 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 and it's difficult, it's hard. And, and sometimes I can't see what's around the bend. And then I just have to remember a simple word that I read in the Bible long ago, a word from the one who walked along the Sea of Galilee, the one who walks the streets of this quaint and curious little town, the one who still beckons and will not let me turn away from his continual call. Follow me. May God grant us courage and wisdom to follow Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Hallelujah. 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 H